Welcome to Couples Therapy. Hi everybody, Nikki Mara here and welcome back to my YouTube channel. I hope you've all had a fabulous week and are ready for another fun ranking video. And I am so unbelievably excited for today's video because you guys chose this one. I put a poll up on my Instagram last week asking you what video you wanted to see and you guys used your voices. Over half of you that ended up voting really wanted to see a ranking of Disney couples. And so today we're gonna do just that. If you're new here, my name is Nikki Mara and I am a Disney content creator. I got my start over on TikTok but have moved on over to YouTube. And I have been loving making long form content. It is so much fun and I absolutely love that all of you are enjoying the content in the channel so far. If you are excited for today's video, make sure to like and subscribe down below so that way you never miss magic from me. And seeing as this is the first video posted in the month of June, I would like to wish each and every one of you a happy Pride Month. I feel as though it is always so important to show up authentically as yourself. So as long as it is safe for you to do so, be who you are and love who you love because you are perfect just as you are. And speaking of love, we're going to be doing a whole ranking based off of it today, as Disney has some incredible Disney characters that end up in relationships. Some of them are so great and admirable, and others have mm, things about them that aren't the best. So we are going to be breaking down Disney couples relationships today and ranking them from worst to best. And because there are literally so many Disney couples that have been created, we do have to limit the list a little bit today. So before we get into the list, I am going to go over some brief disclaimers and conditions for the list. But if you do just want to jump right into the ranking, then you can jump right to this timestamp. First and foremost for our disclaimers, I am not associated with the Walt Disney Company. All of the opinions in this video are just my own and I do not speak for the brand or the company. And secondly, I I welcome any and all opinions on this YouTube channel. So if I happen to rank a couple super low that you really love, make sure to tell me why you love them so much down below. And if I rank a couple really high that you don't think should be there, let me know why. We all have specific and individual connections to these Disney characters and their movies. So be sure to let me know all of your thoughts down below because I absolutely love getting to connect with all of you about our favorite Disney characters and movies. Now, apologies in advance. The conditions for today's list are Lengthy. Starting off with our conditions, both characters in the coupling must be created by the Walt Disney Company and appear in a Disney animated movie. This does mean we will not be including any outside companies such as Pixar, Lucasfilms, 20th Century Fox. We're just sticking to Disney. The second condition is that they must officially be recognized as a couple by the Walt Disney Company. This does mean we will not be including any fan-shipped couples on this list today. Think of characters such as Elsa and Honey Marin. They do interact in their movie and a lot of fans think they should end up as a couple together, but it isn't official by the Walt Disney Company. Yet. <laughs> the third condition is that both characters must appear in their original animated movie. So we won't be including couples that are formed during movie sequels. In addition, they must be a romantic couple, so not just a pairing. And the best example I can give for this is Peter and Wendy. They're not romantic, they're kind of just coupled together in the parks, but they are in no way romantic. Peter would not have that because he would have to grow up. Next, one of the two characters must be a main character in their film. And the final condition for today's list, I know there are so many, I'm so sorry, but the final condition is that animal characters can be included, but they must be anthropomorphic. Well, Disney Nikki, what does that mean? Well, animals that are anthropomorphic look and act like humans. Think animals that dress in human clothes and have very human-like tendencies. Essentially, I'm just making this a rule so that Robin Hood and Maid Marian can be on the list. <laughs> but yes, those are the six conditions for today's list. I know it's a lot, but I had to keep this list minimal because we have a lot to discuss. So with all of those disclaimers and conditions out of the way, that leaves us with 17 couples to rank from worst to best. And for each couple that we talk about today, we are going to be hitting a few specific points. We're going to be talking about the good of their relationship, the bad of their relationship, the impact their relationship has on the movie, any songs that they have together, and the final point we're going to discuss is who is the stronger half of the couple. So sit back, relax, grab yourself a snack and a drink, and let's spill all the tea on Disney couples. We are starting all the way down at the bottom of my list today at number 17, who is Pocahontas and John Smith from the movie Pocahontas. Now, I have mentioned this many a times on my YouTube channel before, but I find the pairing of John Smith and Pocahontas to be a little uncomfortable to watch. And the reason for this is the Disney movie is very historically and culturally inaccurate in such a way that is not respectful to indigenous history. The real life Pocahontas or Matoaka was actually 12 years old when she met John Smith 
and John Smith happened to be in his late 30s or early 40s. There was truly no romance between the two of them. The reason that these two characters ended up being a romantic couple in the movie was that the studio wanted to create a Romeo and Juliet-esque film set in colonial times. And so Pocahontas was aged up, John Smith was aged down, and a romance was created between them. And to mirror the story of Romeo and Juliet, the split between the Capulets and the Montagues became the split between the colonists and the indigenous peoples. Now I'm going to say right off the bat that I am not the correct person that you should be listening to when it comes to this topic. I strongly encourage doing a little bit of research and finding indigenous voices that have spoken on this topic, so that way we can all understand why this depiction isn't necessarily truthful or helpful when it comes to speaking about indigenous figures. But for the purpose of today's list and for the entertainment purposes of this channel, we are going to be talking about this coupling as strictly characters. Again, they aren't just characters, but for today's list, that is how we're going to be talking about them. So the first touching point is what is the good of this relationship? Well, Pocahontas and John Smith do learn from each other in this movie. John Smith tells Pocahontas a lot about England and all of the things that are different there from in America. Likewise, in the song Colors of the Wind, Pocahontas opens John Smith's eyes to the beauty of her world, and that there really is quite a bit that John Smith doesn't know. And the bad in their relationship is that their love sort of sits in the center of this war between the colonists and the indigenous peoples. Much like in the original story of Romeo and Juliet, Romeo and Juliet's relationship does leave a lot of characters around them in some fatal situations. And we also unfortunately see this with the relationship of Pocahontas and John Smith, especially with the character of Coquam, and even almost Pocahontas's father in the end before John Smith saves his life. Now, as for the impact their relationship has on the movie, their relationship really is like the central part of their movie and really causes a lot of the tension that we see in the movie between the two groups of people. As for the songs, they do have songs individually, although John Smith only has a few singing lines in the song Dig, but in the original cut of the film, there was originally going to be a love song between Pocahontas and John Smith which took place when Pocahontas went to visit John Smith with Nakoma when he is being held the night before he is set to be executing. You might notice if you go back and watch this scene that it seems a little choppy, and that's because ultimately the song was edited out of the film. But the song was called If I Never Knew You, and it honestly is a very beautiful song. However, again, just in the context of the historical inaccuracies, it's kind of a little bit difficult for me to enjoy, but in one of the last scenes where Pocahontas is running towards the edge of the cliff to say goodbye to the ship, you can hear that song as underscoring for her running. But ultimately, they do not have a song together. But for the final talking point, who is the stronger half of the couple? I think you all knew this was coming. It is Pocahontas, 100%. She is a leader wise beyond her years, and although this movie didn't get a lot right, it did give us a wonderful depiction of a strong indigenous woman. But with that, we're gonna move on up to number 16 on my list. Another couple that isn't necessarily one of my favorites, but they're a little bit better who is Tarin and Ailanwi from The Black Cauldron. Now I know a lot of people will include characters like this on their list because they're really not super popular. For probably the hundredth time on my channel as of right now, I am once again gonna say that The Black Cauldron is such a black sheep movie. I personally really enjoy it and I know it's not popular amongst the Disney community, but I don't wanna stop talking about it because I honestly love it. <laughs> but regardless, Tarin and Princess Ailanwi find themselves on an adventure to stop the Horned King from taking over the land with the Black Cauldron. And although they have a lot of similarities with Peter Pan and Wendy, where they very much seem like a pairing, but not necessarily a romantic couple, at the very end they do share a kiss, which means we are expected to know that they are a romantic couple. For the good of their relationship, well, they do end up working together quite well in order to stop the Horned King. But the bad in their relationship is a lot more heavy than the good. They quarrel a lot amongst themselves with Fluter Flom, the third person in their group, often having to sort of step in and be the mediator between the two of them. They often don't agree on a whole lot and go about things their own separate way. I guess it's just what happens when two very strong-minded characters have to learn to work together. And while ultimately it works out, it does lead to a lot of tension in the middle of their journey. For the impact that their relationship has on the movie, 
Honestly, it's not a big one considering their romantic relationship doesn't really start until the end of the movie. In all honesty, they really work together as friends with Fluter Flom for 90% of the movie up until the very end. There are hints here and there that there is an attraction, especially when they butt heads and it's supposed to seem like an enemies to lovers sort of situation, but ultimately the romance isn't necessarily right in your face. It does seem a little out of place at the end. And seeing as The Black Cauldron is not a musical, Tarn and Alon, we do not share a song together. And who is the stronger half of the couple? Well, in all honesty, they kind of even themselves out. And believe me, I'm not going to do this with every couple we're talking about today, but there are a few where I do feel like both halves of the couple are very even. And Tarn and Alon, we sort of sit at the same level for me, but it's not necessarily a super high level, which is why they end up at number 16 on my list today. With that, we're moving on up to number 15 on my list, who is Aladdin and Jasmine from the movie Aladdin. Now, I think by the end of this movie, these two lovebirds have a lovely relationship together. However, if you have seen my videos before, namely my Ranking Disney Princes and Ranking Disney Princesses videos, you will know that I have quite a big problem with Aladdin's lying. It is a major plot point that throughout the story of Aladdin, Aladdin often lies in order to cover up his true identity to get himself into situations that are going to better his own situation. And this often includes lying to Princess Jasmine about who he is. Whether it's out of shame or embarrassment for being a street rat, it turns out that in the end, Princess Jasmine loves him for who he really is. And his constant need to lie sort of shows that he himself is insecure, but also that he doesn't necessarily trust Jasmine to be a wonderful partner. Well, that's the vibe that I get out of the situation anyway. As for the good in their relationship, they do end up working together to save the city of Agrabah, and they also happen to share one of the most lovely Disney duets ever written, which is A Whole New World, which is including on my Ranking Disney Songs video, which I will link up above in case you're interested. But yeah, that's really all I see as the good in their relationship, and the bad is really Aladdin's lying problem. It just happens one too many times in the movie for me to ignore it and say that they have just a beautiful relationship. Again, by the end of the movie, it sort of evens itself out and he is a bit better in the sequels, which I don't necessarily take as canon, but they do exist. So do I have hope for them going forward in the future? Yes, but you know, it's shaky in the movie. <laughs> as for the impact their relationship has on the movie, I honestly feel like it comes in and out as the central focus. It does set off the events of the movie where Aladdin and Jasmine meet in the marketplace and a lot of the events of the movie sort of go off of that. But then once Aladdin gets to the Cave of Wonders, it sort of centralizes around Aladdin and Genie's relationship, but then goes back to Aladdin and Jasmine during A Whole New World, but then turns into the fight between Aladdin and Jafar. So it's a whole lot of back and forth. And while, yes, the relationship is constant throughout the movie, it's not always the central focus. As for the song, we have already discussed A Whole New World, which is the absolutely gorgeous duet between the couple. It did win the Grammy for Best Original Song, and I love the animation sequence. I think this is the perfect moment for Aladdin and Jasmine to have a really strong moment together as a couple. And as for the stronger half of the couple, Jasmine. After everything I've said about Aladdin and Jasmine, I feel like that was just obvious. Jasmine is the obviously better half of the couple because she accepts Aladdin with all of his faults, including is lying. And considering Aladdin and Jasmine are still together as a couple, as you can meet them together in the Magic Kingdom, I assume that it hasn't been too much of an issue since and that they are getting along just wonderfully. And with that, we're going to move on up to number 14 on my list, who is Cinderella and Prince Charming from Cinderella. Now, I will not necessarily categorize this as a bad relationship, just more so one that doesn't really exist on the screen. As for the good points, we get a lot of beautiful montage moments between Cinderella and the prince at the ball, but as for the bad, it's really just that and the wedding. Not much here to report on, to be completely honest, <laughs> as the impact that their relationship has on the movie is little to nothing, especially when you take into consideration that the entire search for the girl who fits the slipper isn't conducted by the prince himself. It is the Grand Duke who is going around to all of these different houses trying the slipper on young maidens, and he ultimately is the one that finds Cinderella. Now granted, the live-action movie did fix quite a bit of this issue of the lack of prince, and in all honesty, I always thought that the animated Cinderella didn't necessarily have a love story at the focus of it. I always saw it as more so a story about a girl who is just trying to escape her situation. Cinderella is very obviously unhappy 
be in her home with her stepmother and stepsisters, essentially becoming a servant in her own home. And so her entire story is getting herself out of that bad situation, but remaining kind and compassionate while doing it. And as for the song that this couple shares, they share the song So This Is Love, which is sung in voiceover at the ball at the prince's throwing. Cinderella and the prince dance together in the main hall, but once they leave the big crowd of people, they have this voiceover song, which I think is honestly very beautiful. But one thing that I actually really love about this song is that, in all honesty, it sounds like the prince is singing about Cinderella, but the lyrics that Cinderella sings, in all honesty, sounds more like she's talking about the time that she's having. So this is love, so this is what makes life divine. I'm all aglow and now I know the key to all heaven is mine. There's really no mention of the prince in these lyrics. She could totally be singing about the wonderful night that she's having. So while yes, this is a beautiful love duet, and I'm not gonna say that it's not a love duet, it is, but in my opinion, the relationship between Cinderella and the prince isn't the focus of the story. And I think it is quite obvious who is the stronger half of this relationship, considering the prince realistically has, what, less than six, seven minutes of screen time, and almost no speaking lines. <laughs> when comparing the prince and Cinderella, Cinderella is obviously the standout character, as we follow her throughout the entire movie, and we are really experiencing the events of her life with her along the entire movie. We become so much closer to her and root for her to win in the end that she really ends up coming out to be the stronger half of this relationship. But with that, we're gonna move on up to number 13 on my list, who is Snow White and the Prince from Snow White and the Seven Dwarfs. And I can already hear the influx of comments that I'm about to get. His name is Prince Florian, Prince Florian, Prince Ferdinand. I, in my videos, go by what the characters are named in the movie, and he is not named in the movie, so I'm going to be strictly calling him the Prince. But Prince Florian, Ferdinand, Florian, whatever you like to call him, is a fan-made name. It is, as of right now, not recognized by the Walt Disney Company. And if you go up to Snow White in the parks and ask her about her prince, she's only going to refer to him as the prince. And so that is what I am going to refer to him as. Snow White and the prince have a complex relationship in their movie to talk about. In all honesty, they don't spend a lot of time on screen together. And the main reason for this is that back in 1937, the Walt Disney Company was having a hard time realistically animating male characters. And creating the realistic prince was just a very difficult task for the company. They just hadn't mastered it yet, and so they didn't want to leave him in the movie looking a little busted. So the prince shows up at the very beginning of the movie and sings a beautiful song to Snow White. We very quickly learn that she is interested and she expresses this interest to the dwarves, even singing a beautiful song about the prince to the dwarves, and how she hopes to one day marry him. And then the prince once again appears at the end to bestow true love's kiss upon Snow White. And then after she awakens, they go together to his kingdom. It is a very simple story, and it needed to be for the time it was created. As for the good parts of their relationship, it is quite obvious that the prince is very interested in Snow White, and Snow White is also interested in the prince. She has this cute little moment right at the very beginning where she She's hiding behind this curtain, but she sort of like snuggles herself up like she's in love, but she doesn't want to show it yet. She also has a moment where she herself sends a kiss to the prince via a little bird, whom she kisses and then sends down from the balcony down to the prince, and then the bird sends a little kiss to the prince. And it is very clear that Snow White is happy to see the prince at the end when she awakens, as she gives a huge smile and there is a wonderful celebration. Now as for the bad, I guess we're gonna say it, the prince kisses an unconscious Snow White in the middle of the woods. Not necessarily the best energy, but this isn't necessarily a romantic kiss, but more so a kiss of goodbye. He thinks she has passed away. And seeing as he did develop feelings for her at the end, I feel like this is more so a kiss of goodbye rather than a kiss of romantic interest for an unconscious Snow White. Moving on to the impact that their relationship has on the movie, it's not necessarily the biggest. Snow White continually says throughout the movie that she is in love with the prince, but we really only see this romance at the very beginning and then the very end of the movie. It really doesn't appear anywhere in the middle. As for the songs, they don't necessarily share a song together except the very end of I'm Wishing. And so these characters individually sing songs about each other, but they don't have a song together because the prince also has one love and Snow White has Someday My Prince Will Come, which I guess sort of helps to round out their relationship, but they don't really sing together. And as for the stronger half of the couple, once again, I need not go into detail. The answer to this question is very obviously Snow White. But with that, we're gonna move on up to number 12 on my list, who is Milo and Kida from Atlantis, The Lost Empire. Now, I'm gonna be honest. I think this relationship isn't the most memorable to me. However, there's really nothing 
super negative that I think about when I think about these characters. And so while everybody that we've talked about thus far can have a little bit of negativity thrown in about their relationship, I really don't see this with Milo and Kida. As for the good, they really just get along. They seem like a perfect fit. I guess the only bad that we can really say is that like their age difference, like Kida's like what, thousands of years old and Milo's gotta be in his 20s or 30s. The relationship doesn't really have a big impact on the movie. They don't sing a song together because it's not a musical. As for the stronger half of the relationship, they're honestly kind of even. This is very much my ground zero relationship. Like, I don't have a ton to say about them. I like them. They're okay. But they're definitely nowhere near my favorite. If we were tiering this list, they would be the definition of like a C tier. There's nothing bad about them, but there's nothing necessarily interesting, in my opinion. Next, we're moving on up to number 11 on my list, who is Belle and Beast from Beauty and the Beast. Now you might be thinking, that's awfully low, but we're gonna get into it, don't you worry. For the good, this is probably one of the most wonderful depictions of two people having a long time to fall in love. Beauty and the Beast literally takes place over different seasons. We see Christmas come and go, and the couple moving on into springtime. The good in their relationship is that they are able to take a very tremulous beginning and turn it into a very solid, strong relationship. The bad, however, is that it starts off in pretty much the lowest possible situation, where Belle is literally a captive of the Beast. Granted, she doesn't necessarily stay that for long, very quickly breaking out of that and not being associated with a damsel in distress title, but as for the impact that the relationship has on the movie, that's really where they shine. Considering the entire story arc of the movie is the improvement of their relationship. It's the move from the completely unstable relationship to the relationship where they have true mutual respect for one another and help each other in times of need. As for their songs, they have the song Something There together, which again is the beginning of the hint of feelings for each other. It's really the only song we have where the Beast sings and it's definitely a cute moment where Belle and Beast sort of realize that oh, wait a minute, I might have feelings for this person. And it's really sweet and cute, and it only grows from there. And as for the stronger half of the couple, while I could definitely just immediately write it off as Belle, I do feel like the Beast is quite strong in that he is really the character that we see the most growth and development from. Even though the story is labeled Beauty and the Beast, it's really a story about the Beast's transformation from this really dark and grim human into one who is able to love another human. So for the stronger half, I would say that they're pretty equal, especially by the end. But with that, we're moving on up to number 10 on my list, who is Princess Aurora and Prince Philip from Sleeping Beauty. Now, many people immediately write these two off as just the cliche, very shallow, not a whole lot of depth Disney couple, but I see their relationship on screen as just the pure definitive soulmate connection. These two characters, as simple as they both may be, are just destined to be together. They are betrothed when they are both very little. Aurora is literally a baby. But then as the story goes on, they meet in the woods and fall in love without any of that destiny being known by either of them. Philip finds out from Maleficent that she is literally the love of his life, and he goes and defeats a dragon for her. There's just so much pureness and happiness around these two characters. So again, for the good, these characters are destined to be together and they just work perfectly. This movie, more than any other one, shows us that love can be very simple. As for the bad, once again, like Snow White and the Prince, it can be said that Prince Philip bestowing the kiss upon Princess Aurora, who is not awake, is not the best look. However, I will also throw in here that the three good fairies, who are arguably Aurora's mother figures in this movie, are present when the kiss is bestowed, and also Prince Philip is literally told the entire prophecy, not only when he's a child, seeing the fairies in Maleficent giving their gifts to Aurora, but also as an adult, captured in Maleficent's tower. He knows the prophecy, and he knows the only way to save Princess Aurora is bestowing the kiss. As for the impact the relationship has, while I can say it is very simple, it is a very simple storyline, and it is the main storyline, truly. Their relationship and working towards their happily ever after is really the main focus of all of the side characters. As for their songs, they have by far my favorite love song in any Disney movie, which is Once Upon a Dream, which is just beautiful with the sweeping music, the gorgeous, gorgeous voices, and not to mention the dreamy appearance of the woods around them. And as for the stronger half in the couple, in all honesty, I 
think I might give it to Prince Philip. He literally fights a dragon for Princess Aurora. There is no doubting this man's feelings for his princess, especially after that final battle. But with that, we're moving on up to number nine on my list, who is Anna and Kristoff from Frozen and Frozen 2. Now, this couple, in my opinion, has their good and bad. The good is definitely that they have a very secure relationship in terms of communication. Kristoff is always there for Anna. Anna is always there for Kristoff, except for one thing, which leads us into the bad, which is when Anna's attention is more on her sister than on Kristoff. Granted, I absolutely understand that family always has to come first. And Kristoff and Anna aren't yet married, which means they're not technically family yet. And so when Anna is running around trying to help Elsa with all of these different tasks and finding out the truth about her powers, her relationship with Kristoff kind of gets put on the back burner. But again, where their strengths come back in is that Kristoff's love is not fragile and that he can handle being second to her sister, which ends up making for a really great pairing. For the impact their relationship has on the movie, in their first movie, they really don't become a couple until the very end, considering their kiss isn't even what saves Princess Anna. They actually never share a song together in either movie, even though both are musicals, although Kristoff does sing Lost in the Woods about Anna. And as for the stronger half of this relationship, I would definitely give the stronger half of the relationship to Kristoff, even though I technically think Anna is a stronger character. But again, we're talking about the romances today, and I think that Kristoff is a lot more single-handedly dedicated to the relationship, mainly because he doesn't have other family that he needs to put first before Anna. That's not necessarily a fault on Anna, but yeah, I'm gonna give it to Kristoff on this one. And with that, we're moving on up to number eight on my list, who is Tarzan and Jane from the movie Tarzan. As for the good in their relationship, in all honesty, they both teach each other quite a bit. Jane gets to learn a lot about the gorillas from Tarzan, while Tarzan learns about the world outside of his life from Jane. As for the bad, I really don't see a whole lot, to be completely honest. But the impact their relationship has on the movie is, it's not necessarily the biggest plot point. It's very sweet that they end up together in the end, but it's not a necessity. But to me, it doesn't necessarily seem like the most important part of this movie. The most important thing is saving the gorillas at the end of the day. As for the songs, characters in this movie don't really sing. It's more so all voiceover by Phil Collins. There are quite a few songs that show Tarzan and Jane falling in love, but the characters never sing. And as for the stronger half of the relationship, they kind of seem pretty even, considering they are both teachers in each other's lives. They both have something interesting about their life that the other is very intrigued by, which in my opinion keeps things pretty even between the two. With that, we're moving on up to number seven on my list, who is Robin Hood and Maid Marian from Robin Hood. I love this coupling. I think they are so cute, the only animal pairing on today's list. And what I think is the most interesting part about their relationship is that they have a backstory. We don't necessarily know what it is, but when we meet Robin Hood at the very beginning, he's already thinking about Maid Marian from the past, which is, in all honesty, very interesting because we really don't see this with any other Disney couple. As for the good, they are both very devoted to one another and they both very much have mutual feelings. They both talk about their crushes on each other all throughout the movie. As for the bad, we just, there's not much, we just really don't know what their backstory is, or why they were separated at all. The impact the relationship has on the movie isn't the biggest, because it's really about the fight against Prince John, but in all honesty, I'm very intrigued by their love story. I think they're an absolutely adorable couple. As for their song, they do not necessarily sing a song together, but they do have a lovely montage where they go on a date out in the woods to the song Love. And I love this song. It almost made my top 30 songs. But yeah, I absolutely love this little montage. I think it is so cute and shows off a gorgeous and once again, simple relationship between two leading Disney characters. And as for the stronger half of the couple, I think Robin Hood is overall a stronger character because we get to see more of him, but I don't necessarily think Maid Marian is weak in terms of this coupling. So I'm gonna say it's pretty even. With that, we're moving on up to number six on my list, who is Mulan and Li Shang from Mulan. I love this couple. I think they are so strong, so fun, and they have such a great dynamic. As for the good, I think it is very interesting to see their relationship blossom, considering Mulan starts out also with a secret identity. However, what's different from Aladdin is that she's not necessarily lying to Li Shang, 
for a relationship sort of thing. She is lying in order to protect her father, which I think is a much more noble cause. But really, the only bad that I find is the little bit of animosity that happens between the two of them when Mulan's identity is revealed. And the impact their relationship has on the movie is not necessarily big. Their feelings only really happen at the very end of the movie. Unless you're like me, where you totally think Li Shang had feelings for Mulan before he found out she was a girl. But realistically, they only end up dating at the very end of the movie. And they really don't have any songs that depict their relationship or romance at all. And as for the stronger half of the couple, I think it's literally quite easy to say that these are two of the strongest characters that Disney's ever created. And so I would say they are very equal in terms of both putting in effort into this relationship. Moving on up to my top five. At number five is one that you guys are going to find very shocking. At number five is Ariel and Eric from The Little Mermaid. Yes, there are four relationships that I think are stronger than Ariel and Eric, but regardless, I love this adorable little fishy and her prince, and we're going to talk about him. Let's start off with the good, because Prince Eric, quite literally for three days, is able to maintain all of the conversation in this relationship. He keeps things flowing. The reason that they're able to go do activities and have fun conversations conversations even though Ariel can't talk is because of Prince Eric. And when Ariel's identity is revealed that she's a mermaid, Prince Eric's feelings do not waver and he very quickly races into the sea in order to help his little mermaid. As for the bad, I mean we don't necessarily see their relationship progress at all. At the end when Ariel is transformed back into a human, they kiss on the beach and then we see a fade cut to their wedding. We don't necessarily know how long is in between there, it could have been years, but we don't necessarily see any of that relationship building before their wedding. It's very much meant to say, here is the beautiful relationship they started and they did end up getting married. How long did it take? What happened in between? Who knows? As for their songs, they don't necessarily have songs together because Prince Eric isn't a singing character, although Ariel does sing Part of Your World reprise, and they do technically have a date to the song Kiss the Girl, but there are no songs between them. And as for the stronger half of the couple, while I do think they're pretty even, Ariel actually saves Prince Eric more than Eric saves Ariel. She saves him from the shipwreck, she saves him from marrying Ursula on the ship, and she also redirects Ursula's trident blast to hit Flotsam and Jetsam instead of Prince Eric. And Eric, of course, saves her at the end, but I think Ariel puts a little bit more effort into keeping her prince safe. Yes, they were both my number one and number one on ranking princesses and princes, but in terms of the relationships, there are four couples that beat them out. Let's get into it. At number four on my list is Phoebus and Esmeralda from The Hunchback of Notre Dame. I think these two characters have such incredible chemistry, it isn't even funny. They are both witty and are able to banter back and forth with each other in a way that's truly comedic. The entire scene where they're fighting with the candlestick and Phoebus' sword in the cathedral is so fun to watch. And I think the wit that both of them bring to the relationship is honestly very special. That's all of the good, and in all honesty, I don't see a whole lot of bad. They're always sticking up for each other and fighting to keep each other safe. The relationship doesn't necessarily have the biggest impact on their movie, although I do think it adds quite a bit to the movie. They do not have a song together, as Phoebus doesn't sing, and Esmeralda is more so focused on her people. But in terms of who's the stronger in this relationship, I honestly think they're very even. That's something you will notice from here on out, because the strongest relationships happen when both people are putting in a lot of effort. At number three on my list is Hercules and Meg from the movie Hercules. Once again, I love this couple so much, especially because they have a somewhat deceptive beginning, but very quickly they are able to establish a true and honest relationship. Meg is of course working for Hades at the very beginning, which makes things a little bit sticky, but what's very good is that her relationship with Hercules sort of turns her into not wanting to work for Hades anymore and just get the deal over with so that way she can be free. They grow a very honest and loving and caring relationship for one another, where Hercules fights for her and saves her multiple times, but Megger is the one that makes the ultimate sacrifice, actually passing away in order to save Hercules. When a giant marble column is about to fall on Hercules, who has lost all of his strength, Megara pushes him out of the way and sacrifices herself to save him. So yeah, the good is that they fall in love and develop a very strong relationship. The bad is that, I mean, Megara is practically enslaved by Hades at the beginning and sort of has to act as his puppet, but again, she's able to get herself out of that situation. 
the impact their relationship has on the movie is very positive. It is not necessarily the main focus, as that belongs to Hercules becoming a true hero, but I love that he gives up his life with the gods in order to be with Meg at the end. As for their songs, they don't necessarily have a song together, although Meg does have a song where she sort of denies her feelings for Hercules, but in the end finally accepts them. And as for the stronger half of the relationship, once again, I feel like they are pretty even. I told you it was going to be a running theme. <laughs> With that, we're moving on up to number two on my list, one that my Tangled fans are going to be very happy to hear. Yes, at number two is Rapunzel and Flynn Rider from Tangled. I love this couple. I think they are so dynamic and fun and interesting, and they even each other out in so many different ways. In my opinion, this is the truly most like good cop, bad cop sort of duo. Rapunzel is so sweet, innocent, and naive, and Flynn really takes on this whole sarcastic bad guy banter with her. And it's so fun getting to see them sort of both even out as Rapunzel sort of develops that little bit of sarcasm in order to throw it back at Flynn, while Flynn also develops that sort of soft side to his heart, eventually falling in love with Rapunzel. Their love song of I See the Light together is just beautiful. I really can't think of anything bad Bad about their relationship either. They're both always there for each other when they need it. Except for the beginning when they're not necessarily romantically involved, but more so see each other as a means to an end. But that very quickly goes away and they grow feelings for each other quite quickly, so it's, it's nice to see. And as for the stronger half of the couple, once again, they are quite even. As it is wonderful to see them balance each other out and have a wonderful time together, A, going on adventures, but also falling in love with one another. And at number one on my list of favorite Disney couples, can you possibly guess who it could be? Yes, at number one is Princess Tiana and Prince Naveen from The Princess and the Frog. Now, I know their relationship doesn't necessarily start out the best, but in my opinion, this is the best depiction of enemies to lovers in any Disney movie. Even though they're not necessarily enemies, they don't get along at the beginning at all. They are two completely different humans coming from two completely different backgrounds. Prince Naveen is literally born with the silver spoon in his mouth, whereas Tiana has had to work for everything she has in her life. And they come at this relationship with those views behind them, and they really bang heads quite a bit. But as time goes on, Prince Naveen starts to understand Tiana and where she's come from in life, and starts to help her work towards achieving her dream, even giving up his dream of wealth in order to see her dreams come to fruition. I absolutely love the adventure that these two go on together, and what I love about this movie's romance is that we also get to see a lot of hype around the relationship from the side characters in this movie. Charlotte LaBeouf, Louis, Ray, and Mama Odie all have an extreme interest in Tiana and Naveen ending up together, to the point where they do various things in order to help these two get together. And so while the impact their relationship has on the movie wouldn't necessarily feel as big because their goal overall is to just become human again, their relationship sort of takes front and center because of all of the other characters having that emotional investment in their relationship. As for the song, there isn't necessarily a song where the two of them fall in love, although Ray does sing the song Ma Belle Evangeline, which sort of serves as a falling in love montage for Tiana and Naveen, although it's not necessarily about them. And as for the stronger half of the couple, in all honesty, I'm gonna have to give it to Princess Tiana because she is just the hardest working princess out of all of them. And while she may not put a ton of effort into the relationship at the beginning, it very quickly becomes a priority to her. And it's understandable as to why she doesn't right off the bat, because love hasn't necessarily been the forefront of what she's wanted in life. What she has wanted was really to fulfill her father's dream, and when she ends up doing that, she realizes that love is also a big puzzle piece of her heart that she wants to include in that final vision of a dream. And so yeah, because of all of the hype that Tiana and Naveen get in their movie from everybody else, as well as the wonderful Frenemies to Lovers storyline that they have, I absolutely love watching these two lovebirds fall in love in their movie. And it is all of that that lands them number one on my list of favorite Disney couples. <sighs> and with all of that, we have reached the end of today's list. Thank you so much for watching. I had so much fun diving into all of these fun Disney relationships. If you enjoyed today's video, make sure to like and subscribe down below so that way you never miss magic from me. I'm also going to link a playlist above of all of my ranking videos that I have ever done, so that way you can discover more of my personal Disney favorites. If you would like to find me on any of my other social medias, my handle is at Nikki Mara with two Y's and two R's, and you can find me on Instagram, TikTok, and Snapchat. 
I would like to thank you all once again for supporting the channel. It means so much to me, and I definitely did not expect all of the love that I am receiving having just jumped over to YouTube. I had said to myself that when making my YouTube channel, I want to make magic for everyone, but what actually ended up happening was that all of you have made magic for me, and so I want to thank you all very much, and I am so excited to continue making content for you guys and to keep talking about all of our favorite Disney things. And believe me when I say I have a lot more video ideas for the future, and there is plenty more to come on this channel. Not just rankings, but also some other fun Disney activities that I cannot wait to share with you guys. Thank you again so much for watching. Enjoy the rest of your week, stay magical, and until next time, I'll see y'all real soon.